Welcome to this third part of the Getting Started with Jakarta EE9, where I explain a few things around the context and dependency injection specification, also known as the CDI spec, in Jakarta EE9. So the CDI spec is also updated to that Jakarta namespace uh, within EE9, and I'll show you in this video how you can inject a bean, uh, a CDI bean or service as it sometimes is called, into an YAXRS endpoint. We go briefly over the scopes, but more of, of the scopes can be seen in the JSF video, which I will present later on. I also cover the interceptors and the events that you can create with CDI. So let us start from the example with the REST endpoint we created in the previous video. In the previous video around the Jakarta REST, we created an endpoint like this, where we accepted a name parameter uh, through the path, and we also accepted a language through a query parameter. So instead of just returning those values, let us now do a proper greeting, a greeting service, which um, replies with the correct language and not just hello uh, the name, but uh, for instance, in French, we can uh, return bonjour. So for that, we create a new CDI bean. Uh, it's also called serve service. So let's call the class a greeting service where we define a method, a method which returns a string, which returns the greeting template. And based on the template is of course depending on the language. So we specify the language as a method parameter. By default, we support English. So we return hello with the name, but of course we can for different languages. Uh, for French, we return bonjour, and for German, we return willkommen. So this is our service uh, as that based on a language uh, performs some, some business logic. And we can make that a CDI bean. Uh, it's by default a CDI bean because it has a no argument constructor. But it is um, always good to mention explicitly that this is a CDI bean and that it needs to be created in uh, the application scope, which means that there is only one instance of this bean created within your entire application. So this service now, we can use that in our YAXRS endpoint. Although the YAXRS resources are not really um, CDI beans, we can still inject that um, that service within that hello resource here. So we define the greeting service. And then instead of just returning this fixed code, we can say that it must use the string format from the greeting service, get template, get greeting template based on that language that we received and the name that um, this, this some value is it called here, the name that we received from the endpoint. So whenever this YAXRS endpoint is called, uh, for instance, uh, through that URL that we have specified, then a instance of that greeting service is injected if it's not available for the first time it is instantiated by the system and then it is available made in this class and then we can call any method so we do not need to instantiate it ourselves we do not need to look for it what we want to instantiate the system does that for us uh, that's the principle of uh, dependency injection so i have built my web application through Maven and I have deployed it on the Bayara server which I have running here. So the application is deployed successfully 
which means I can curl that endpoint. I remember um, the XRS rules about it. So this is the endpoint, the hello. This is our, this is my parameter, and this is the language in English. And then I receive my hello Payara as expected because it's in English. If I put it in French, uh, I get the reply Bonjour Payara. Our service is working. It can be injected. In the case that you need to initialize your service, eh, whenever the service is created that you need to do some initialization code, you need to perform some actions, you can indicate uh, the method that needs to be ex executed by annotating it with the post construct annotation. So you can, you can initialize any kind of um, resources that it needs. Uh, for instance, it can read from a file with some um, contents that it needs for the proper operation of your service. As you have seen, I did not configure anything specific for CDI. Uh, that's because the dependency that we have uh, defined in our project, uh, the uh, Jakarta EE Web API, uh, which we defined earlier on in the first video, also contains CDI, uh, the context and dependency um, injection specification, because that's also part of that web profile. You have the possibility to configure a few things, and that's what we need for the next feature that I want to highlight is how you that how you can create a CDI interceptor. So let's first create that um, Beans XML file, as it is called. So it has a certain namespace, and uh, remember now that with Jakarta EE9 that namespace is changed with previous versions, and it is a best practice that you um, indicate that only classes that are annotated with that, for instance, that application scoped, that they are considered as CDI bean, uh, so that you have a better performance. Uh, not all beans are considered, not all beans are, can be instantiated. Not all beans need to be, um, uh, the metadata needs to be created and kept into memory. Most of the time, people, do not care about this uh, and this namespace and just use the beans xml and th that works also fine um, and then you have a generic configuration which you can use um, on all versions and um, so that's also the reason why i remove it here now so what do you need to define for a interceptor uh, for instance um, let's have that greetings ser service I want uh, to add some functionality each time this um, method is called. Uh, for instance, the, uh, I want to have a timing of that method. Uh, interceptors are ideal if you want to um, implement some cross-cutting concerns, as they call it, as uh, some logging, security, timing, etc. All those things which um, needed to be applied to many methods, but you do not want, of course, to implement it or call it in each method. It is much easier that you, for instance, annotate your uh, method like this with timed and that then a certain um, interceptor code will be called. So this at timed, we need to create such a annotation. So let's create the timed annotation. And we need to specify a few things here. And the main thing here is that we define it as an interceptor binding. So this at timed now is linked to a interceptor. We also need to define when the annotation uh, will be available. So we need to define the retention policy. And we define it that it, it's, that it will be available during uh, runtime, of course, uh, because it will be used um, by the system at runtime to define if the value um, and if the method needs to be timed or not. So I have so I have sorted out the imports and uh, the annotation can be used on a method or a class itself, uh, which is a, a typical usage. Uh, so you can use it on one specific method or if you put it at a class level, then all methods um, will have that interceptor. 
The next step that we need to do is actually create the code that needs to be uh, performed. So we created for that a timed interceptor class. Where we define it that this is an interceptor and it is linked to that uh, timed an annotation that we have defined for our interceptor. And then we need to implement a method, a method which has a invocation context as parameter so that we know what is um, uh, on, on which method it, uh, our interceptor is applied. And our class can have multiple can have multiple methods so we need to identify the method that's uh, that is the actual interceptor by using the at around invoke annotation code uh, the original method uh, can be invoked by using here the context proceed method so that means that we have um, uh, that we call the result uh, the, uh, that we actually call the method and get the result. By default, it is an object because it can be anything. But of course, you can perform some things uh, before um, the method ex executes and things um, after that the method um, is um, executed. If we want to do something after, then of course, we need to keep first the result, for instance, and then return at the end of the methods uh, what we want to return what the intercepted method needs to be returned and one of the things uh, that you can do have like uh, we said this is a interceptor for getting the timing then we can define here the um, time so we start with keeping the time before the method started And then we can return the result. We know that it is um, that it is a string value, so we can safely put here a to string that, of course, limits the usage of our interceptor here, of course. And then we add here a certain um, value to our response. I calculated in a number of seconds, so that is then calculated as system current millis min start milliseconds so as you can see you can modify uh, you can modify either the parameters that you specify uh, that you pass to the method itself here uh, the intercepted method or you can modify the um, return of the method of course or you can just perform some things like logging checking security etc which do not interact of course with the parameters and the result interceptors are not active by default so we need to specify here in that beans xml file um, that there is an, an interceptor and that the interceptor class name is uh, the fully qualified class name of our class that we have implemented so I have compiled the application again. I did a redeploy on the server. So I have updated my deployment on the Payara server. It is successfully. So I have the new version, which means I can again do a curl to that endpoint. And then you see that the text here is added to the uh, to the result of the method and that my endpoint returned the entire value and yeah since my service is not doing that much it is so fast that um, it is within the same millisecond for as so for the creation of uh, interceptors uh, you need to remember that you need to uh, create that interceptor binding the actual interceptor uh, with the around invoke where you define that it is an interceptor and don't forget to specify it in the beans xml file uh, that that interceptor needs to be active so if you have watched the jakarta rest video that i created earlier 
You probably remember that we had the person Pojo object there, a person where we keep the name and the age of the person, and that you had the possibility to post uh, the data in JSON format to the endpoint, and that there was also a possibility to return a person in JSON format. So let us change this example now a bit where we can post a person, but we keep somewhere a list of all the persons that we received. And we are going to use CDI events for that. So that is a very lightweight and very efficient um, publisher subscriber mechanism where you can emit uh, some events and on the other hand you can capture those events and perform any kind of action that you like to do with that event. So let's first create that person cache where we are going to keep a list of the persons. So we have a list of person that we have here. It's a list. So it is a list. So import the correct package. And we have all persons. And by default, it's an empty list, of course. We can retrieve all the values and adding a value is then through that CDI event mechanism. So we are going to add person and that means that we can do here an observe, observe an event. But first of all, we need to create that event. So a new class at person event, which is just a pojo. So there is no need for a specific implementation and no specific abstract class, no annotations at all. It is just a POJO class. Um, and so for this demo, I'm just storing the person in the event itself. Uh, you can add multiple values, of course. Um, so with the constructor, we set that value and we can retrieve the person value. So back to our cache here. So we observe the at person event. And every time that it happens, well, we update the person. Uh, we add that person to the list. So that's all that we need for the cache. Uh, it is a CDI beam. So it is best as mentioned that we define a scope. We only need one cache, so it is the application scoped one. And for other scopes, uh, you can see the JSF video, which will be released later on. So now we need to rework our person resources here. This is not the ideal situation, of course, because we will submit here and retrieve here uh, in the same class, so um, it's not um, really separated, but you will see there is there is only a link for retrieving the persons uh, from that cache. So let's inject that cache because we need that for the retrieval. So we have the person cache. And then instead of returning just one person, we can return uh, the entire list that we have and we retrieve them from the person cache. So that's one thing. The other thing is that we need to be able to sub submit one. So we are not returning anything anymore, which means that we will have a status 201 if we call this method. And now we need a way to emit that CDI event and that can be done by Again, injecting injecting a specific type. Uh, it's called the event class. Since there are multiple, we need to make sure that uh, we include the correct one. And we need to specify the pojo on that event. So that's the add person. And then import the correct one. So it is the Jakarta Enterprise event. And then we have here an instance which can emit that CDI event with that payload at the person. So at person event, fire a new 
at person event containing that person. So this is all what is needed. So there is uh, the subscription is in the in the cache. There we listen to all the events, and here on this other um, method here we fire those events independently. We can have multiple places where we fire those events and we can have multiple places where we um, capture those events. So it is a really decoupled system where you can just react on some events without tight coupling uh, between the two systems. And here then of course we need that person cache to return them so that we can actually um, verify if the person really is cached in that system or not. So let's now compile and test out the application. So after compilation and redeployment, the application is updated and has that new person endpoint, which means I can perform a curl command uh, where uh, to that endpoint, that API slash person endpoint, where I specify the data for that single person. Uh, that's, that's the data that we are submitting in application json format we don't get any results at uh, is a 201 so curl does not um, return anything if we then check with the get what that cache contains then we see that it contains the one person that we have submitted so at uh, the event made sure that the cache is aware of that call and um, kept it in the list that we have specified here if we test another call, so we put another person with other, inf uh, with other information. If we then do a curl again, you see that the second person is now also returned as the response. So in the CDI getting started with Jakarta EE9, I showed how you can inject a CDI bean or service uh, so that it is managed by the system, the classic dependency injection, which you also know from other systems, and how you can initialize that service with that at post construct um, annotation on a method. We also saw how you can create an interceptor so that you can in, um, change the behavior of methods, um, mostly used for logging and uh, security. And then there was the demo of the CDI event system where you can um, fire some events uh, at one place and the listener on the other end, uh, which is just a regular method, can re receive that event. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for one of the next videos in the Jakarta EE9 Getting Started series. Bye!